Hello. So I'd like to do a quick wrapper on the class activity that we did today and just review the concepts because they're very important. Um, and then we'll move on to another example. So what we did in class today was we looked at the discrete Fourier transform on actual data that we measured. So up to this point in the course, we, you know, we spent a lot of time synthesizing our sounds from physical models. We said, okay, we, you know, vibrating string, vibrating cavity, it has this fundamental frequency, it has all the overtones or harmonics, which are integer multiples. If we make a sound with, with motivated by that, then it sounds, yeah, it does sound kind of like the instrument. Um, but now that we've kind of looked at the discrete Fourier transform on some synthetic signals, we're ready to, to, to use it on real data. So where we don't actually necessarily know what it is, um, I mean, we might think we know it's a vibrating string, it should do this, but does it actually do this? Do we actually see the harmonics and things like that? So we can use the Fourier transform to put on a different set of glasses, right? Where our coordinates are actually telling us how much of sines and cosines at particular frequencies there are. Now, the one caveat of this, as I talked about in class, is if you have a frequency which is not perfectly aligned with one of the bins, so it doesn't go through an integer number of cycles over the interval that you're looking at, um, you will not get exactly one frequency per cosine. Actually, all of them will be activated a little bit, um, which is kind of interesting. That, that if you assume that this thing is periodic, that it keeps going at that period after this interval, um, you, you can actually construct, you know, by using all of, of the cosines and sines, you can actually make any frequency, not just the integer ones. Uh, but we have to be a little careful when we use this to, to try to figure out or infer what the frequency is, because, um, you know, as you see, especially when you get halfway in between a bin, it kind of splits. So right now, I'm between 8 and 9. It's kind of split between 8 and 9, 9, 10. You know, when I was exactly at 10, I was, I was fine. But So that's just something to be aware of. But still, we'll proceed by, by just trying to f use a naive thing where we look for the peak and the amplitude. So as I told you, um, I defined a version, some code um, that does this much faster than the code that we wrote. The code that we wrote before actually looped through all the frequency indices and for each frequency index did the dot product with the sine and the cosine. Um, those who have seen algorithms, that's an O of n squared algorithm because we have n samples um, and we also have n sines and cosines total to go through. And when we do the dot product, that's an order n. So for all of the n sines and cosines, we also have to do a sum over n products. So that's n squared total operations. There's something called the fast Fourier transform. This, this only takes O of n log n time, which is much, much better. So n log n is much better than n squared. Um, this makes it so we're going to have longer signals now because a lot of the synthetic stuff I was showing you, I mean, this only had like 40 samples. That was really nothing. But now we're going to be loading like four seconds of audio, so we're going to have like 200,000 samples. Um, 200,000 squared is, is a pretty large number. So you know, that, that's getting up there close to a trillion. So um, we, we're not going to want to deal with that. Wait, 200,000 squared. That would be, I just want to check. Yeah, okay, in the billions. Um, anyway, so it needs to be faster. So n log n is much better. All right, so, so we're going to load in me playing the violin. And let's listen. Okay, maybe I need to put some rosin on my bow. It sounded a little scratchy, but but that was a real sound. Okay. Um, so what we got to do now is call the discrete Fourier transform that. So I'll, I'll return the, the cosines and the sines, and I just say get DFT of x. Okay, so this is going to return two arrays. Um, let me also determine what the frequency bins are. So. I guess I could say k is equal to mp dot a range length of c. So I'm going to say, okay, the first one was 0, the next one was 1, the next one is 2. Um, that's what a range does, right? So, so that'll create all the frequency bins. Um, but I, I want to actually convert this into frequency in hertz, which I can do because I have the sample rate. So I can say that the frequencies in hertz actually are the frequency indices times the sample rate over 
the length of x. So that was the formula that you came up with um, on the last module. So now I can go ahead and plot, let's plot maybe the cosines versus the frequencies. Um, and here's what we see. Okay, so we see this pattern. Um, if I zoom in a little bit, so this is Hertz, let me actually put the label there. Um, and let me zoom in on, I guess I'll go from zero to 2000 for now. Okay, so I'm seeing some peaks. I mean, I, okay, I have negative amplitude as well, but then I'm seeing something around 440, which, okay, this is a concert A. That was just my A string. Um, cool. Uh, it's a little weird though that it goes positive and negative. I don't really care about the phase. I just want to know the amplitude. So what I can do is remember that the amplitude at a particular frequency um, index is the square root of the cosine component squared plus the sine component squared. So we can do that for all frequencies at once by using NumPy operations. I mean, I could do this in a loop. I could say 4K in range length of C, you know, amplitude is equal to the square root of C at index K squared plus S at index K squared, square root it. I could do that, but a much faster way to do that is to say the amplitude is equal to square root of the element y square of all the cosines plus the element y square of all the sines, and that's it. So let me throw the amplitude in there instead of the cosine, and I get this. Okay. So one thing, one of the things you notice about this is that well, okay, yes, the peak is at 440 hertz, but I also have the harmonics. So I wasn't lying to you when I said in, in real um, instruments that you get these harmonics, so these integer multiples of the base frequency. Um, and you can see that they de overall decrease in amplitude as you go down. And, and you can actually kind of see that, that um, one over frequency fall off, that harmonic series. But it's not as quite as simple as I said, you know, some of these are, are a little bit smaller and then they jump up and they're smaller. That's because I'm not just playing a constant note. Actually, there are other things going on that kind of make this a little different. But, but you can see a lot of the patterns that I talked about even in real data. So that's kind of cool. We put on a different set of glasses and we can see that um, our hypothesis about what, what is happening in real vibrating strings actually works out. Okay, now if I go down an octave though, so let me just play the sound. So what I see is I get a peak still at 440 hertz, but I also get a little peak that I didn't get before um, at 220 hertz. This is really the base frequency. Um, I might get tricked though, because I might actually say, well, the greatest peak happens at 440, but but something that wasn't there that's that's there now is is this this lower frequency. And, and also, you might get some context clues by noticing that, you know, I might think, you know, this probably isn't a 440 hertz though, because there's a harmonic that happens at 660, and, and there's a harmonic that happens um, at what's 880 plus 220, that happens at um, 1100. So those are not harmonics that would happen at 440. So you can kind of look at the spacing here and see that this is this is, this is really a different note. It's an octave below the one before. But I wouldn't necessarily see that from just picking out the peak, okay? So I had to look at a little more of the spectrum to, to understand that. We call this the spectrum, okay? I had to look at more of the frequencies to, to really see that. Um, but, but let me go back and just show you how to do the naive thing of peaking out, picking out the peak. Because what I have are, are two parallel arrays. One is an array of um, frequencies. The other one is an array of amplitudes. So what I can do is I can figure out well, what's the index of the maximum amplitude. So there's a command in NumPy called argmax. So I can say mp.argmax um, amp. Let me be consistent with freaks, I'll call this amps. So overall the amps, um, which index in this array gives me the maximum? Uh, what I wanna do is actually say, well, 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 my maximum frequency then is going to be the freaks at that index. So the, that's going to be, you know, this is a parallel array, so I can use the same index. And let me go ahead, I guess I'll make that the title. I'll say, um, and I can also, I can make a little dot there. I can say plt.scatter um, 
I'll say uh, frequencies IDX amps IDX. Uh, what that's going to do is draw a little dot at the peak of, of where I picked it, and I can also make my title be that. So I'll go out to three decimal places. Say to format um, my maximum frequency. So I'll say maximum frequency is equal to that. Okay, so, so I found my max frequency was 440 here. That seems pretty good. Um, so it worked in this example, but again, it can get tricked on other examples. It's, you know, it's not sophisticated enough to realize that, well, I get, actually, I think it was a little flat there. I think I was a little below <laughs> perfect A3. Um, but it's not sophisticated enough to realize that, that actually this is, this is the frequency that, that we care about. But anyway, but this, this is a basic system. Um, what I could do is I can actually convert this to a note number as well. So we remember that, that the you know, note um, equation is, is we, we say that the frequency is equal to 440 times 2 raised to the note over 12. Well, if we invert this, then we're saying that um, the note equals the frequency over uh, log base 2 of the frequency over 440. So that I'm just finding the inverse now, solving for note. Um, hang on a second. And then, no, so I divide the frequency over 440, I take the log base two, and then I also have to, um, multiply by 12, right, okay. So let's, let's do that. So I say note equals log base two of frequency over 440 times 12. So say the maximum frequency is that, note number is that. So you notice these are little placeholders you can put in strings and then you say format and then say what goes in the placeholders. Um, I meant to say max freak here. Okay, so we got a note number of 0.01. Let's just round it. I'll just say um, round. So here, okay, this, this is a note number of zero, which remember 440 is, that's the note number of zero. Um, if I, let's load another example. I think I had E4. Now this one, so this is supposed to be, okay, let me, let's listen to it. This is an E, which is actually a fifth of A. Um, it's the fifth note in an A major scale. Uh, also, it's seven half steps above. So really, its base frequency is 660. So you see, I got tricked here. But if you look at the intervals, you see the intervals are 660. So I got a little tricked, and I actually thought it was um, one, two, three, not even. Um, yeah, so, so we thought it was two octaves above where it actually was. So 660 times four is this number. But let's see if, you know, what we can do is I mean, it really should be, okay, 660 times three, or 660 times four, rather. And that really should be 2640. So maybe I was a little flat here as well. Um, but what I can do is just take the modulus of my guest note. You know, maybe I, I went up octaves by accident. But let me take the modulus by 12, because remember, every octave I repeat myself. So I'll just say um, that the note is, is equal to all that stuff mod 12. Okay, I guess a note number of six, you know, it's really supposed to be seven, but that's close. Okay. Um, so not bad. Let's see about this E3 here. Okay, so, so this, this one's actually pretty good. So E3 is supposed to be 330. Again, I think it was a little flat. So that was one octave down. This, this one actually picked the correct peak there. Um, and we got the note number of seven, which is, which is cool. So okay, so now we're, we're you know we're on our way to building our first basic system that does this stuff. So I just wanted you to see this in detail how this all worked. Maybe I need to tune my violin next time too, <laughs> but but this is this is close enough to to show that the concept. Okay.